Even knowing that my life, too, might always be in jeopardy. Even knowing the agony I endure each time Peter has to swing into the gathering darkness, I wouldn't trade our marriage for anything in the world. Today on the Comic Book Report, Spider-Man by David Michelini and Mark Bagley, Omnibus Volume 1 from Marvel Comics. Stick around and check it out. Greetings webheads, my name is Dominic and today you're tuning in to the Comic Book Report, where we review comic books and graphic novels so you can get an idea of what to read. And today I can't wait to talk about the Michelini Bagley Omnibus Volume 1. For those that perhaps don't know, this run on Spider-Man takes place directly after the David Michelini and Eric Larson era on the title. We get some great early 90s Spider-Man adventures in this book here. Honestly, I can't wait to just dive right in. Before we do, though, a special thank you to all of those at OrganicPriceBooks.com for sending this copy over for review. If you're interested in picking up your own copy or just want to shop around for incredible comic book collected editions, I highly encourage you to check out their website. You can find a link for it in this video's description, and if you see anything there you like, you can actually use my discount code at checkout, The Comic Book Report, to save $2 off of your order. Please note if you use my affiliate link or code to make a purchase, I will earn a small commission, but it's a fantastic way to support this channel. Thank you so much for considering, now let's get started with today's Omnibus Review. First, some quick facts about today's collection. The issues in this volume were written primarily by David Michelini, Al Milgram, Fabian Nietzietza, and more, and penciled primarily by Mark Bagley, Guang Yap, Marie Severin, and more. The comics in this volume are published by Marvel Comics beginning in 1991. The volume itself collects The Amazing Spider-Man issues 351 through 375 along with annuals 25 and 26, as well as material from Spectacular Spider-Man Annual issues 11 and 12, Web of Spider-Man Annual issues 7 and 8, and New Warriors Annual number 2. And finally, this is an oversized hardcover edition with nice glossy print paper stock, a sewn binding, and a total of 1,040 pages. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and issue a general spoiler warning. I will be flipping through the contents of today's collection and commenting on plot points throughout. You've been advised. Okay, and here's our first look at that Spider-Man omnibus for today, and right from the top, I will say this is the standard edition cover for this omnibus. I'll go ahead and throw up a quick snapshot of the direct market cover, just so you can do a quick comparison and kind of decide which of the covers you prefer. I will say I much prefer the standard edition cover just because I love Bagley's approach to pretty much all of the main Spider-Man rogues gallery of villains. I just think it's an incredible, incredible cover. I believe it was lifted from a cover of a Marvel Age issue. Anyway, going to the spine here, we have this beautiful white background. We have Spider-Man by Michelini and Bagley, and of course a volume one with an image of Spider-Man on the bottom. Interestingly enough, they dropped the amazing Spider-Man from this omnibus spine. I thought that that was interesting. Granted, there are some Spider-Man issues that are not from the amazing series, like those annuals I mentioned earlier, but still, it's just a little bit of a change up from some of the other released Spider-Man Omni. What I love seeing is the back cover here that has our thumbnailed covers for all of the issues included in this incredible collection. I love seeing it all at a glance. You get a really good feeling of what you're in for. And honestly, this was such a fun run and I cannot wait for the volume two. Looking back at the front cover though, I do want to spend one more minute examining the complete dust jacket this time. I'll go ahead and show us the interior flaps of the dust jacket and then I'll spread everything out so you can see the complete dust jacket cover at a glance. Again, please note this is the standard edition cover which means it has a different front cover and image on the bottom of the spine. All the other details I believe remain exactly the same for both covers. 
After we look at the dust jacket though, let's go ahead and transition to the under the dust jacket artwork we have printed on the hardback book itself. We have a great picture of Spider-Man. This has a background of black, which is a stark contrast to the mostly white dust jacket we have. Uh, the spine has some reproduced language, and overall in the back we have some of the webbing. And when you spread out the entire hardback book, we have kind of a wraparound image of sorts with Spider-Man and his web against a field of black. A really sleek and kind of minimalist looking design under the dust jack. Overall, I think a well-made book. Okay, and now that we've wrapped up the exteriors, let's go ahead and transition to take a quick look at this Omnibus's binding. Again, I mentioned this is a sewn binding, and for my money, I actually thought this was really well bound. We do have a nice little eye, at least on my copy, and I would say this book laid flat pretty much that first read-through. It all really worked well. I had very minimal gutter loss. Granted, this is still an era where we do have some borders around some of the paneling, so again, not too much loss to the gutter, and this read extremely well. Okay, breaking into the book itself, we have some black end pages, a heavily red title page, followed by kind of the publication page, the creator breakdown uh, kind of credits page, and then we have a full table of contents with numbered and titled issue and page number. I love seeing that. I know that's something that you don't see with a lot of modern omnibuses, but in early 90s, we still have everything nicely page numbered, and I just think it is beautiful. After that, we jump right into the first issue of this collection, which is one of the annuals. However, before I jump into talking about some of the stories that are included in this collection, I want to give a little bit of, maybe not context, but just more about how this book is sort of mapped and put together. Something I will say, if you're just going in totally blind, I do think that this is fairly accessible to new readers. Obviously, Spider-Man has quite a bit of history at this point. I think most notably, he's still newer, married to Mary Jane Watson. I believe he's in graduate school over at college, he's still working for the Daily Bugle, but beyond that, you can really just kind of jump in. As far as the mapping, everything is done, to my knowledge, chronologically, but during this time, we have a lot of these great crossovers that happen, especially in the annuals. You know, we'll have a, an amazing Spider-Man annual, a spectacular Spider-Man annual, a web of Spider-Man annual, and we'll kind of jump from one to one to one to tell a multiple-part story. These annuals are also usually overlong. They sometimes have backup stories at the back of them, so you have your main Spider-Man adventure, and then you'll have a backup story about Cloak and Dagger or Silver Sable or Venom or some kind of other smaller character interaction and it's a great way to kind of build out the world of Spider-Man, kind of promote some of the supporting cast of characters, the villains, things like that. So these annuals are really big, huge standout issues and the fact that a lot of them are multi-part crossovers just make the scope of storytelling rather epic. We also have a New Warriors annual issue that is included as part of a big crossover that Spider-Man does with New Warriors at one point in this book as well. Beyond that, it is just the amazing Spider-Man issues, those, I don't know, 25 issues or so. Interestingly enough, Amazing Spider-Man at that time had a couple points where it was doing bi-weekly issues rather than monthly, so you'll notice some of the issues are like this month early or late, and it's kind of the idea that this is the one that was released at the first half of the month and the back half, respectively. So just to give you an idea of kind of the cadence and flow of some of these issues, and again, kind of how things are mapped. But every Everything is done really chronologically and really great. I also bring it up just to serve this idea that a big part of this omnibus are these epic scale multi-part storylines and crossovers. We have crossovers with notable heroes like Black Panther and Iron Man in the case of the first big story in this omnibus. And then later on we have some great crossovers with characters like Moon Knight and Punisher and Darkhawk, uh, Nova, Night Thrasher, the New Warriors. It really is just pretty incredible. We also have notable appearances from characters like Felicia Hardy's Black Cat, which is always fun. Honestly, it's just a cavalcade of great Spider-Man and Marvel Universe hero characters. I think for me, this is one of the most impressive parts about this omnibus. I know the last omnibus I was reading that chronologically came before this was actually the David Michelini and Todd McFarlane era, um, at least for Amazing Spider-Man. I d missed out on the Eric Larson-David Michelini collaboration, although that's getting reprinted, and I did go ahead and pre-order it. I can't wait to read those issues, and that's sandwiched right between, but I wasn't too much of a stickler for chronological order, just really when I could get these books.
But at any rate, during the era of David Michelini and Todd McFarlane, we had some issues that were definitely multiple part storylines, but I don't remember it feeling like this, where the storylines themselves are more epic and multi-leveled, spanning across annuals, or in many cases like, you know, five or six issues or parts to it, and I really like that because I think that this is a transition into a much more modern convention of monthly superhero comic book storytelling, where we're really starting to veer away from the one issue is one storyline era and more into this kind of you know where you read a couple months in a row to get a full storyline i think that is a narrative structure is something i like more because i feel like you get more characterization more twists and turns and you can kind of fill out the plot line a bit more not that i don't like that more episodic style where you get more of a bang for your buck for each issue but again these kind of longer form epic storylines i just really do enjoy and i did see inklings of that in this omnibus and i just thought that was worth mentioning i honestly really enjoyed it Okay, now to talk more specifically about some of the storylines we get in this book. I will say I'm going to do kind of a scatter shot of some of my favorite stories collected in this book rather than something that's more comprehensive of every single storyline because even with multiple parts, there was still a good handful of storylines throughout this book. So kicking it off, that first annual, we have this really fun, uh, great story with Spider-Man, Black Panther, and Iron Man. And it's essentially a Heroes versus the Roxxon Corporation who at this time try to make an artificial vibranium, which of course is of consequence to Black Panther, who has that as his main country's resource over in Wakanda. And to have kind of a counterfeit or potentially black market vibranium substitute on the market, it just could spell disaster for his country. Plus, he just wants to have Investigate. He doesn't really trust in Roxon, and it brings him to New York. We also, of course, have Iron Man, who is himself kind of a capitalist industrialist who has his own powerful company, who is also investigating what Roxon's doing over here. And then we have Spider Man smack dab in the middle, kind of caught in the crosshairs. Interestingly enough, this vibranium substitute has the, this ability to kind of degrade metal, and it's kind of combustible and volatile. Basically, it's defective material, but they're trying to pawn it off and sell it and try to use use it in manufacturing wherever they could to make a buck in spite of the danger. And we basically have these heroes trying to stop Rock Sun along the way and try to stop them from using this faulty vibranium. It's really a fun story and I thought it was a clever way to get these characters together, Iron Man, Black Panther, and Spider-Man. I don't think I've ever read a story with just the three of them, but it honestly made a lot of sense and it worked and I really enjoyed it. The next story I want to talk about kind of takes that same vibranium plot thread, but it brings us back to the character of the Tri-Sentinel, which I believe was introduced during the Eric Larson era on Spider-Man, or at least there's a notable battle with Spider-Man versus the Tri-Sentinel. That's the battle where he actually gets the Captain of the Universe powers. Uh, anyway, really fun. They introduced that during the uh, Micronauts, the uh, Captain Universe. Anyway, Spider-Man gets those powers to fight the Tri-Sentinel. I only bring that up because we have his rematch with the Tri-Sentinel in this book, but of course he does not have the Captain Universe powers. What is he going to do? The only thing in his corner is the superhero Nova from the New Warriors, and the two of them kind of tag team to take down the Tri-Sentinel, which is using this counterfeit vibranium. I thought this was a really fun way to dovetail on a previous story while also familiarizing ourselves with Nova. If you haven't read New Warriors or his own title, I know Bagley was an artist on New Warriors for some time. I know that's a really beloved uh, franchise that has had its own sequence of omnibuses. I have yet to read it, although I really want to, and I think after getting to know the characters a bit more through this omnibus, because many of them cameo a bit, I definitely want to read it quite a bit more so. Other storylines in this as well. Speaking of New Warriors, we have Night Thrasher show up for this really epic storyline about sidekicks. Uh, we have Night Thrasher, uh, who else? Moon Knight, Punisher, I think Darkhawk and Spider-Man, basically trying to stop the Secret Empire, which we have Moon Knight's protege kind of getting swept up in. He's become this kind of horrible cyborg creature. I think his name was Midnight. And anyway, he sort of abducts Richard Ryder's Nova, which of course flags Night Thrasher to try to find his teammate. We have Moon Knight into the fray wanting to confront Midnight, and then we have Punisher just trying to stop the Secret Empire. And Spidey, once again, just kind of caught in the fray. 
If you want to know the title of this storyline, it's called Round Robin, and for me, it was definitely a highlight in this collection. Once again, we have a bunch of different vigilante characters teaming up within the Spider-Man book, and it was really fun. It was multiple parts, and again, we just have Spider-Man teaming up with a lot of these other characters. And again, I think that that is really a predominant factor in this omnibus. It's a really big Spider-Man team-up book. We do have some solo issues where it's mostly just Spider-Man versus some villains, but a lot of this book is these collaborative collaborative efforts, and honestly, it made it feel so much more embedded into the Marvel Universe, and I think it was one of the better strengths of this book. So much fun. Another story I want to talk about that is definitely a big selling point for this omnibus for some, I'm sure. If you're a fan of the symbiote characters, this does have the birth of Carnage. Yes, they introduced Cletus Cassidy earlier on, and there was maybe inklings that stuff was going on with him, but this is where Carnage full-on makes his appearance, breaks out, and just goes on a killing rampage and we have spider-man trying to stop him realizing that this is in fact the offspring of the villainous venom if you don't know carnage is cletus cassidy who is given his own symbiote he was already a serial killer but now he's empowered by the symbiote unlike venom he can make projectiles and he has a bit more kind of chaotic and fluid motion compared to venom but similar to venom he doesn't set off spider-man's spidey sense and he's just really lethal and intense in fact he is so strong and so radical that spider-man just reasons he cannot stop him on his own in fact pretty early on he realizes the only one that may stand a chance against him is if he pairs up with Venom to stop Carnage. And this is really fun because the last time we saw Venom in a previous run, we had Venom thinking that he had killed Spider-Man and he kind of retired on this private island, kind of was enjoying his life, and Spider-Man shows up with a human torch basically to say, hey, I'm still alive and I need your help. There's this awesome battle on that island. He takes out the human torch and Spider-Man and Venom just have this great fight, but ultimately they form an uneasy alliance to try to take down Carnage together. Together. I had read this story when I reviewed my old Carnage trade paperback, Once Upon a Time. This is also included in the Spider-Man vs. Venom omnibus, I believe, so there is some double dip for omnibus collectors out there, but it's really great to have it in context of the proper run. I think it's really earned and well-deserved, and it's an example of not feeling like a big multiple character crossover, even though we do have Human Torch and we do have Venom. Uh, it feels more like a straight-laced Spider-Man story, albeit a bit dark. Darker. Another big multiple part storyline I want to discuss in this book, as you can see actually as I'm flipping through right now, is the Hero Killer storyline. This is honestly a big Spider-Man New Warriors crossover, where basically Speedball of the New Warriors is sort of kidnapped. They don't know what happened to him, and so Night Thrasher and team kind of assemble to try to find him. Uh, Spider-Man gets caught up in it, tries to find him as well, and there's basically this organization that is kind of rounding him up to experiment on him and he's abducting or rather this organization is abducting all of these other superheroes or people that manifest kind of mutant or powers to kind of absorb or experiment on. Anyway, New Warriors are caught in the fray, Spider-Man there as well. This is again a multiple part storyline but it's really fun and we don't know exactly who's behind this, what's going on, who's funding it, uh, exactly how that's shaking out uh, and I really like that, the kind of mystery in it, what's going on here. We know that this uh, group is kind of high hiring some local muscle in the form of different villains, like I think Rhino shows up at one point, Hydro Man, and a good handful of others. Um, ultimately, though, one of the big players in this hero killer storyline is actually the Sphinx, which has previously battled, I believe, New Warriors. Um, but anyway, it's a really good multiple part crossover as well. By this point in the Omnibus, we've already seen a good handful of the New Warrior characters a few times, particularly Nova and Night Thrasher, but we have like Firestar, Namorito, Silver, Silhouette, uh, Speedball. Again, it's just a really good time. I have not read New Warriors, as I mentioned earlier, but I presume if you've read that, this is even more impactful. And I love that we get so much crossover from Mark Bagley, who did art on both. Uh, this is, again, where we have that New Warrior annual kind of thrown in here. Uh, but yeah, a really fun story. And even for someone like me who wasn't familiar with a lot of the New Warriors characters, I think that this honestly was a pretty good introduction to them. Uh, this storyline and the earlier one with Ralph. Robin. Uh, but yeah, really good stuff here. I love the art throughout it. 
Now another huge dangling plot thread we get through a lot of this omnibus as well is the emergence of these two unknown at first uh, middle-aged characters who seem to be traveling toward New York, toward Peter Parker. There's a lot of implications that, hey, we might change his life forever, or what's the impact going to be? And throughout a sequence of issues, it's slowly revealed that they are in fact, at least allegedly, Richard and Mary Parker, Peter Parker's dead parents. Yes, wow, huge jaw-dropping just revelation that occurs here, and it coincides right with the 30th anniversary of the first appearance of Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy 15. So we have this epic anniversary issue where we have this kind of familial revelation, this hits the floor, and in this 30th anniversary issue we have some great like essays, like we have Stan Lee showing up writing about the initial like Spider-Man boom and everything with that, looking back on the legacy at that point again about 30 years i think this is around 1992 um but yeah just a really amazing issue and then throughout the rest of the book we have uh richard and mary parker uh just kind of bunking with aunt may who is herself quite shocked everyone's just trying to process this update peter is extremely wary because as spider-man he just assumes this has to be maybe one of his villains or someone found out his secret and the whole time he's really trying to vet who these people are are they legitimate they seem to be suffering from some, um, you know, memory loss. Allegedly, they were in kind of a Russian prison for decades after kind of a CIA secret agent kind of stuff. A mission went poorly or whatever. Uh, we also know that canonically, they met their end due to the Red Skull, or at least that's what it appeared like when that was covered in an early Amazing Spider-Man annual. So right around the time of these revelations, we do have an appearance by Red Skull, which is a ton of fun. We have Taskmaster being hired. So we have a lot of great, like, villains that show up around this and we have Spider-Man just dealing with this level of uh, kind of just conflict dealing on the home front here. How does this change his life? What does this mean for his life? Aunt May deals with kind of sharing P uh, Peter again and uh, you know Mary Jane seems all for it but is worried about Peter Parker her beloved husband, of course. And that actually is another kind of dangling plot thread that goes on throughout all this book. We have Mary Jane struggling to cope uh, with just the ever-increasing uh, pressure that Spider-Man is putting on her marriage. Yes, she agreed to it, but it's more of like she can't uh, deal with the stress of not knowing if he's going to be hurt or come home, so she picks up cigarettes, uh, which was an interesting turn for this character. They're still deeply in love, but we just have Mary Jane just physically you know, she has a toll taken by having her man be Spider-Man and just constantly worried about him. Uh, but yeah, we get some great character development from all of Parker's family with Mary Jane and Aunt May and Richard and um, Mary. Um, and I just really like that. I thought that that was a cool wrinkle. And that leads into one of the last stories in this book. It was a two-parter where basically Venom comes back when he realizes that Peter Parker's parents are allegedly alive. He breaks out of his uh, containment and tries to basically kidnap them and ruin Spider-Man's life yet again again. Uh, this was really fun and that I think coincided with the 30th anniversary of the Amazing Spider-Man issue 1 if I'm not mistaken in issue uh, 375 of Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, but yeah that was really um, a kind of scattershot of some of my favorite stories in this omnibus. Like I said there's even more than that. I barely touched on Black Cat who shows up again. She gets her new costume and some kind of new augmented uh, technologies to kind of help her fight again as Black Cat. Uh, we have the Tinkerer show up at one point we have a bunch of other villains kind of make their appearances throughout this as well. Um, but overall, a really stunning collection here. And as a fan of Mark Bagley, particularly Mark Bagley's Spider-Man, this was just a real treat. I've loved Bagley ever since I read him in Ultimate Spider-Man, which is, I think, my first exposure to that artist. Uh, love, love, love his Spider-Man in that. I loved Chip Zdarsky and Mark Bagley's Spider-Man Life Story. I've covered that a couple times on the channel as well. But it's really fun to go back and see when he first got his shot with with Spider-Man proper here with Amazing Spider-Man. It should be noted as well, I mentioned it at the very top of this video, but Mark Bagley is not the only artist we have on the book, in the same way that David Michelini is not the only writer on this book. Like I said, there was a couple annuals, a New Warriors issue, and, and those in particular, we don't always have the same writer or artist, uh, but more than that, we do have, especially the artist change hands a couple times, or sometimes the backup stories and some of these issues weren't written by David Michelini or what have you. I bring that up because this is a creator titled Omnibus, you know, this is Spider-Man volume whatever. This is Spider-Man by 
Michelini and Bagley, Volume 1. Um, but we do have other creators attached. But what I like with what Marvel did here is they didn't exclude the issues that had other creators attached to it. They gave us a full chronological run, beginning after Eric Larson and presumably leading up to the Volume 2 Omnibus. Because I think they're trying to round out the collection for a lot of us Omnibus collectors that are trying to get a really large straight run or chunk of a run. Uh, and I just really like that. But I think for purists out there that only wanted Michelini and Bagley issues there are more than that in this collection but i think that that is absolutely an asset again trying to collect these issues in this oversized format now that I've read more of the David Michelini era of Spider-Man, I know I've dabbled with a lot of his stuff with Todd McFarlane on Amazing Spider-Man, and now I've read this entire omnibus with the front half of his run with Mark Bagley, and again, I'm hoping to have that Eric Larson Michelini omnibus coming out in the next month or two, but I'm interested to see the progression of this writer on Spider-Man. I know he dominated kind of that late 80s, early 90s Spider-Man era, but it's fun to see him trade off a lot of these just really all-star comic book illustrators you know like Todd McFarlane just dominates completely revolutionizes the style of Spider-Man everything I've read from Eric Larson's era on Spider-Man I almost feel like he's trying to keep the aspects of McFarlane that he likes but then also just striking really dynamically with his own flourishes and touches and then Bagley I think takes a lot of the kind of kineticism and energy of some of those creators but it almost feels a little more straight laced uh, but again still a really great innovation on the character and anyway it's just cool to see the voice of Michelini throughout this era kind of evolve and has his sophistication as a Spider-Man writer, I think, grows. Um, it's just really interesting to see how that writing does with all of these incredible artists as they change hands. Uh, but certainly this pairing of Michelini and Bagley, I for one am a huge fan of, and this book was a ton of fun cover to cover. And as we reach the back of the omnibus, I'm delighted to report we have a ton of extras. We not only have covers to issues and specials and trade paperbacks reproduced in this book, we also have a ton of extras in the form of essays or think pieces written during the Spider-Man anniversaries or some of the uh, crossovers or just a lot of, you know, we have stuff from the artists, we have interviews transcribed, we just, it's packed out with extras. I really cannot overstate it enough a ton of extras at the back. So if you're a big omnibus collector like me, this is a just must read collection in my mind. It's a key point in Spider-Man's history. If you like the nineties era of Spider-Man, I think this is absolutely a must read must buy for you. But even if you're just a collector who want a better feel for this era, for this character, but you also like extras, this is just so rich in it. I really, really love it. And it was fun kind of skimming and making my way reading through some of that. And now it's time to give it a grade. For easily one of my favorite 90s comic character runs, gorgeous artwork throughout it, and a bunch of fun, layered, character-driven, multiple-part storylines, the Comic Book Report is happy to give Spider-Man by David Michelini and Mark Bagley, Omnibus, Volume 1, an A. As a Spider-Man fan, this is a must-read. As an Omnibus collector, it's hard to ignore the volume of extras we get at the back. This is a triumph. I'm so happy they put this together, and I personally cannot wait for the Volume 2. If you're a fan of Spider-Man, New War Mark Bagley in general, Venom, Carnage, again, check out this collection if you've yet to read it. Absolutely brilliant. But let me know what you think in the comments. Maybe you had a different opinion. Maybe we shared an opinion. Either way, would love to hear from you, and thank you all for watching. This has been the Comic Book Report. Please don't forget to leave your like, comment, and maybe share this video with a friend. Thanks again. Have a good one.